share screen. Okay. You can so we don't annoy one another. And should be on the road here. So Bitcoin's nine thousand now. Huh? Bitcoin's nine thousand now. Yeah, Bitcoin is nine thousand, almost ten thousand. Yep. Based on what I don't know. <laughs> you like price of tulips? What about a tulip? You heard about the tulip, tulip run up just based on sheer. Long time ago. Long, long time ago. Long time ago. Tulip. No idea. Is it like a run on tulips, yeah. right? Yeah. At, at one point in Europe, they they both tulips and then oh. they like um, everybody beat up the price. Oh. Yeah. Based yeah. on nothing really. Well, I didn't know that, but yeah. there sure are plenty of things. Sure are plenty of things like that out there. That's why I don't, you know, it's a risky investment because it could come down at any moment. Anyway, today, Project 12, 13, and 15, I don't know what I'm looking for. Okay, 12, 13, and 15. I think we have a guest, yeah, 12 4 guest from NCC Group. Oh, 12 11 is the last class. Please. Twelve thirteen. And project should be this okay. All right, and then the final exam, which is gonna be online and open book, like the quizzes. We'll see how that works. Very few people ever take my finals anyway, so I will. I'm going to try to make it so you can't just look up the answers in the book. I'll see how well I can do that. But, uh, all right. And let's see, got about five minutes here. Let's see what might be worth mentioning about the news. This one was kind of fun. Yeah, Kali Lennox is out. This might be fun. Kali Lennox usually, in my experience, usually break a lot of things, so. I saw that they added a bunch of stuff, but I haven't read about it yet. Yeah, they added a bunch of stuff. Every time they do this, a whole bunch of my projects break, so <laughs> I would imagine that a bunch of things will not work. They always do something. Um, anyway, they had some new tools. None of them look very exciting to me. Inspire for Horns Enumeration on LinkedIn. Cherry Tree for taking notes. Something about um, enumerating subdomains. And something to add to uh, open source in, something to add to Maltigo. There's a whole bunch of people who love Maltigo. I've never got the slightest use out of it, but there must be some virtue I can't see in it. All I ever get is overwhelmed with a million useless facts. But anyway, there's probably some way to use it better than I'm using it. Same thing's true of QRadar. Uh, it's been two weeks struggling with QRadar and I can't get it to do anything. And there don't, aren't any demo videos that would actually do anything. There aren't any instructions to make it actually do anything. So I think I'm wising up a free edition. I made the same mistake with Solaris years ago. It's intended to run on their branded hardware. And the free edition to run in a virtual machine is sort of an afterthought, and I think it's not finished. I've seen this happen before. Um, so I'm going to go on to other things that actually work, um, like OS Sec and Alien Vault actually work. Anyway, Apache Guacamole looks pretty good. A clientless remote desktop gateway. So all you need is a browser, and it will then let you connect to VNC, RDP, or SSH because all the software is on the shirt. That sounds pretty interesting. See how well that works. And this I thought was pretty fun. This came out a few days ago, this Bluetooth hack, but he had a video I didn't notice earlier. Um, you can take over the Amazon Echo. And 
So what you're doing, what well, looks to me like some kind of brute force attack. Trying a bunch of things, then it gets in and gets a shell. You start the listening port, a binding, a port on the Amazon. Oh, and you do need the sound for this one. Then it's going to upload a sound file to the Amazon and make it talk to you. Alexa, my name is Alexa. I have been hacked. Take me to your leader. All right. So this is apparently a, a Bluetooth vulnerability. It affects a lot of things in a Linux kernel. We found out how to hack Alexa with it. So that might be good fun. Anyway, see if there's anything else worth mentioning here. Um, That one's kind of interesting. And oh, this one's pretty good. Aha, uh -huh. a comment. Weird noises like clanking and banging in audio. Hmm. Did anybody hear it? You hear what's that? No, I did not hear it. Maybe yeah. the ticking in the, the thing? Or... Well, someone says they got weird noises. Let's see if anybody else has a problem. Um, I'll try muting everybody again, see if that helps. Anyway, um, all right, so I thought this was pretty good. This little robot, you program it, it follows you everywhere. It's like the robot from Flubber. What's that? It's like the robot from Flubber. Flubber, well, could be, but it's pretty cute. And the idea is it's surrounded by all this junk to make it safe. So it hopefully won't uh, kill people as it zips around going God knows where. <laughs> I don't think it's for sale yet, but uh, I think they would sell, like Roombas. I think a bunch of people would have fun with it, and probably some idiot would outlaw it before long. <laughs> anyway, those look like fun. Um, and this sounds pretty awesome, too. AI-controlled brain implants. Boy, I've seen lots of science fiction based on this. So, so you could just have the government program your brain to stop complaining about things and, <laughs> and to be happy. It could solve all the problems of humanity. It's funny, we'll see how well this works, but anyway, that's something to look forward to. The person who wrote that is not the person. He heard it as well, gone now. Okay, apparently when I muted everybody, that got her. Okay, what was that? The person who wrote that is not the person. You do not electrocute your brain. Well, that's right, yeah, yeah, what's up? What is the movement? What's that? One interesting thing I saw in the news was there's this whole net neutrality thing going on. And right. apparently someone analyzed the comments that were submitted to the FCC right. and they used natural language processing to identify similarities and found that the majority of the ones that are against net neutrality are actually apparently created by a bot. Right. Yeah, that's that's worth mentioning, of course. That's, yeah, the, uh, the, the net neutrality comments are coming out. Although I think um, the guy in charge of the what FTC, FCC yeah. has made it abundantly clear he couldn't care less what comments anybody has and going to do whatever he likes. But anyway, that's right. Um, it is the box, sort of like the Russian box that swayed the election, that are uh, putting up fake comments. And the point of that was cover, so they could say the comments are fake and ignore them. Oh, really? I think so. Yeah, and um, that's the same thing they just tried to do with Roy Moore. I just came out. Uh, they they hired. There's a company that does this for Republicans. Um, they create fake uh, scandals. So they hired somebody to go to the Washington Post and pretend Roy Moore raped her, and made it all up, and tracked her back to the place where they paid her to defend this because they wanted to discredit. So anyway, it's um, you know, dirty tricks are obviously part of media spin. Anyway, uh, I've got the last lecture today. It's not a very long one. Um, we're down to hash functions. I should mention the future. Uh, originally, I had imagined one lecture per chapter, but the last chapters start getting small. So I combined the last two chapters into one lecture. So the last class will be 12 and 13, and so will the last quiz. And that quiz is already up, but it's not due for two weeks because we have a guest next week, and this is the last class. All right. And so this hash function lecture is pretty short, but here it is, such as it is. 
So let's see if I can get this thing here to go off the screen. There we go. It should maybe shrink away after a while. All right. So uh, this is one possible motivation for this. I thought it was pretty artificial, but it's worth mentioning. Um, if you were to sign messages one block at a time and have a whole long block of signatures, that would be really stupid for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is that it would take a lot of time to compute all those hashes. Um, that doesn't really make the least bit of sense, so I'm not going to believe that one because it takes exactly as long to combine them all into one hash, probably even longer. You take so anyway. But one thing about it, which is interesting, is the security limitations. If every block was signed individually, you could just rearrange the blocks. And as we did um, in the web application hacking class, that is a fun cryptographic attack. Rearrange blocks of encrypted text, and you can often accomplish things even if you can't decrypt it because it has something like user ID equals 1,000, and you can flip it with a block that has something else there, and suddenly your user ID is one, and you're root. So, uh, you know, you're, it's kind of, you don't know that you're going to win, but just trying. Scrambling all the blocks of encrypted text often has entertaining effects, like letting you get someone else's account or something. So that's an issue. So obviously, the way it's really done is you have a message of any length, you combine it with a hash function down to one small value, and then you sign that. That's obviously the way to do it. Uh, what is perhaps not obvious is the way hash functions work. Hash functions actually do break your message up into a bunch of blocks and process it block by block, and that leads to a variety of weaknesses, which I've been exploiting in CTFs for the last year or so, and here's the basis of them all. It's pretty odd. These are the famous attacks, although I kind of suspect people who wrote the CTF have been through this textbook, because I found quite a few things pretty much straight from a textbook in the CTFs. So here's the point. You take a message of any length, you hash it, and then it's going to turn into a message digest to the same length. Now, this is, of course, too short for a practical hash these days. That looks like a CRC32 or something, which is what Ethernet uses, but it's not resistant in any way to any of these attacks. It's, it's only useful to detect random errors, not to detect malicious forgeries. So here's the security requirements of hash functions. There are three things you might want. There's pre-image resistance, which means that given the hash, you can't reverse it and find out what was hashed. There's a second preimage, which means if I have a file and a hash, I can't find another file that hashes to the same value. If I could do that, that would be really bad. Then I could download a program, check the hash, and I could somehow add a virus and get the same hash. And your whole point of verifying the hash would be shot. And this is the strong collision resistance, which means even if you're allowed to, to try all the files in the world, and hashing, you still can't find any two with the same hash. So um, those are the three possible hash value, hash functions you might want. So the first one is one-wayness, that the hash can't be reversed. Second one is if you have a specific known value you're trying to hit, you can't find one that hashes to it. And the third one is even if you just hash millions of things trying to find a match, you won't find any matches. So this one's called strong collision resistance because from, it's sort of obvious that if you have this last property, the one in the middle is implied. If you can't even find any collisions given all the files in the world, then obviously if I pick any one file and you try to find it, you won't be able to find that either. All right, uh, it turns out collision resistance is the most difficult thing to accomplish. Although, of course, um, I must say I balked at step one here. We might as well talk about that. It's not in your book, but step one, I'm used to cracking passwords all the time with hashes, so we violate one wayness. But of course, that's because you have extra information, which is that the password is relatively short and consists of printable characters. So, and you, so you try dictionary of passwords to get in. If you really just had random files, you wouldn't be able to reverse it. So it's perhaps unfair to say that we're really reversing a hash function when you crack passwords. What you're doing is checking to see if the password was chosen off a specific finite list. And in no way is that list long enough to hire all possible passwords, except for really weak hash functions like LM hash that really severely limit the length and, and content of the password to where you really can't try them. Anyway, so um, this is the birthday paradox is what is connected to this. If you think about the last case, strong collision resistance, where you're just going to hash a lot of files, perhaps random data, and try to see them match, that is related to the birthday problem. If you ask people for the month and day of their birthday in the room and go around the room with an ordinary classroom of 20 or 30 people, you'll find two people with the same birthday. 
And intuitively, you might think that you had to have half of 365 before you hit a birthday. And see, that's what would happen if you were in case two. If I told you I want someone on the birthday of January 1 and went around the room looking for January 1, you'd have to have 183 people before you have a 50% chance of that happening. But to make two people have the same birthday, all I need is about 183 pairs of people. Because you could match him, and you could match him, and you could match him. And so if I only have 23 people, the number of pairs is 23 times 22 over 2. And that's enough. So approximately the square root of n. If n is the total number of possible hash values, if you hash the square root of n files, you're likely to find that two of them have the same hash value. That's as far as you have to go. And that's why um, MD5 with 128 bits was never approved for any purpose because if you just hash two to the 64 files, you'll probably find an MD5 collision. And two to the 64 is doable. You know, two to the 56 is doable by brute force, and two to the 64 has been done by brute force. Two to the 72 has never been done by brute force, but it's only expected to take a thousand years. And a thousand years in Moore's law is only 30 years. So, yeah. Oh, what is n signifying? n is the number of possible hash values. Which is what, 360? Uh, it's, well, in, in birthdays, it's 365. Okay. This is 365 two possible two times parenthesis, two times n, n parenthesis? Uh, yeah, this Instead is, of, this well, um, here they say it's the square root of 2n. That's possible. This is 1.414 times. Right, that's right. Of time and then square root of that. Oh, yeah. So you get down to the twenty-three again. Yeah. Anyway, so the um, so that's why you hash now. You have to have at least one hundred sixty bits because then the square root of it is two to the eighty, and two to the eighty is an unachievable number. That's what most people call barely enough secure. We've had various uh, analyses from the NSA and other people saying how much security is enough, and the lowest acceptable security is eighty bits because two to the eighty is considered an unreachable number, but anything less than that is pretty. Uh, Shaky. Two to the seventy-two has not been done. Two to the eighty is the minimum distance above that that is generally considered safe. So here's an example: one hundred twenty-eight. You go down. You, if you want a fifty percent chance, you have to be two to the sixty-five. Two to the sixty would be maybe a twenty-five percent chance or something like that. Two to the sixty-seven. Anyway, in speaking approximately, you want the square root, which is two to the sixty-four. One hundred sixty is two to the eighty. Two to the sixty, two to the one twenty-eight, and on it goes. So anything less than one hundred sixty is very likely to have collisions easily found. So it turns out that there are only two types of hash functions in common use. One is the MD4 family, MD4, MD5, SHA1, SHA2, and RIPE MD are all in the same family. They all work approximately the same way. And we'll talk about that in detail. There's another possible way to do it, which is to use a block cipher and use the encryption routine to make a hash. And that is an option, although I'm not aware of any common product that uses that technique. I think there's some example coming up here. Uh, IPsec, I think, actually uses something like that. But um, nothing too common uses it. Anyway, SHA-1, MB5 family, we'll go through SHA-1. These are carefully chosen to use operations that are fast on modern processors, so they're easy to use. So, um, if you want to do it from a block cipher, here's one way to do it. You break your original file into blocks until as many as it takes to use up all the size. Then you start with a known public block, H0, coming in from the left here. Run it through some function if you have to, which means you're going to map it from the block size of the cipher down to the block size of the hash, if those two aren't the same. Or, or it's a mapping function made on me. But anyway, then you encrypt it. And uh, this comes in as the key the previous hash, and you encrypt the next block with the previous hash, and then XOR it uh, with the result. See, so that's what you do. The previous hash is the key, you encrypt it, and then you XOR it with the next block of file data to form the new H, which is then used for the key for the next one. So it's just one way to go cycle, cycle, cycle through the program. So you have many, many encrypted blocks. They're all combined together to create a mess, which is your hash, more or less like cipher block chaining. And there are other alternatives, just as you remember, there was cipher block chaining and there was counter mode and other modes that all approximated about the same thing, where you'd somehow take the output of one block to provide the nonce for the next block. And so there are other ways to do it here. You can just take a different mixture of these. They're, they're all working the same way. You're taking blocks and encrypting them, 
and then you're taking something about the previous block and combining it with the next block to make the one with the current block to make the next block. And there are just different ways to do it, each of which will be similar computationally. And those are available. So any block cipher could be used to make a hash function. But the real hash functions we're using are not built that way. They're built like SHA-1. So SHA-1 is similar to the Feistel cipher, which is what we went through with DES. Remember, you break something up in half and only encrypt one half each time, and then flip it and encrypt the other half. This breaks it up into five chunks and scrambles them together. So it creates 160 bit output, and you cannot run an arbitrary size file through SHA-1. It has a size parameter right in the original data, which only has 64 bits. So it can only handle a message up to two to the 64 bits, which was news to me. I thought they could all do arbitrarily large files. However, the difference is pretty small. Two to the 64 is two million terabytes. So it's not likely that any of us are going to have to have a file bigger than that anytime soon. But it is not infinite. So here's what it does. You break your thing up into a lot of functions of a block size, then you run it through a compression function, and then you take the output and run it again and again and again with the next block, each one combining in, just like the encryption routine. The only difference is the function here is not encryption. It is just a bunch of shifts and XORs and such to mix it all together. Now you have to pad it. It has to fill blocks of 512 bits. So what you do is you have your message, L, you have 64 bits at the end, which is the length of the message in binary. This is where you have 264 maximum length. And then you fill it in with a one and as many zeros as it takes to reach the total. That's the padding scheme. So it's pretty simple, and it does have the length built into it. So if your message is ABC, that's 24 bits of data. So you have ABC, then you put in a one and a bunch of zeros and 64 bits at the end, and you make it all add up to 512, and that's the padded input for SHA-1. It has to be 512 bits. So you're going to have 20 rounds of processing for each of four stages. So you take a message schedule from the 512 bits. You take the 512 bits and break them up into 80 32-bit words which adds up to 512, I think. 240, anyway, mm -hmm. I think, no, it's more than 512, yeah. that's right. And so the point is you have to do something. This kind of has, which the same thing was true of DDS. They ran through a sort of shift in process and so mix them up. So you create more words than you actually have input bits, so they're not really independent. But anyway, then you have five working registers and you create a hash value, which is five values, 32 bits long. And you start with H0, which is the initial value of these things, and you just keep running it through cycles. And your initial values start at these numbers, but you're carefully chosen to make it work. And by the way, if you had a nasty, suspicious mind, you might worry about where these numbers came from. Because I know in elliptic curve cryptography and in other forms of HTTPS, these numbers ultimately came from the NSA. And there is greatly great suspicion that they chose them because they can predict the outcome. But anyway, I don't think that's true of this hash function. But it is the sort of thing that your nasty, suspicious minds might want to check out is exactly where do these numbers come from and do they imply something about the results. Anyway, so you have these five things coming in. You have this message schedule. So you bring in 20 of these words and you do 20 rounds of running a function. Then you take the next 20 words, the next 20 words, the next 20 words, and then you, you create 80 words out of the original data. And so you do four stages of all this mess and then combine them all together at the end. And that plus operation at the end is addition mod 2 to the 32. This is all designed to be fast on a 32-bit processor. That was baked into the algorithm. And here's the actual internals of the round. B, C, and D are combined with a function. The one on the left is shifted to left 5 bits. The next one is shifted to left 30 bits. And then they're moved around. Remember, just like the Feistel network, the left one goes to the right, and the right one goes to the left after each time. Here, each one gets moved over to a different block. And the function there, the combined E, C, and D, is kind of screwy beyond belief. You got and, or, and not, and you just sort of use a different combination of them for each time. Um, and actually, And these functions are just chosen to scramble things, and here's the constant that's used in the value. So it's kind of madness. But uh, beyond my comprehension is exactly why you do it this way, but this is what um, 
This is all invented by Ron Ravest, I think, and he went through many generations of trying to figure out the best way to scramble the bits so that you get the desirable result that if changing any bit of the input makes everything change about the hash, and the hash is not in any predictable way related to the input. Yeah? Is that <coughs> um, the arrows and the, the bar, is that, is that common? No. no. Which one? You know, for your end, no, lower right, the key. Yeah, is that yeah I think it is. Yeah, that's that's oh, bit wise end. I think it comes from symbolic logic, but okay. yeah, there are many there are various options. Yeah, yeah, it's the intersection of two sets, which is I think the same thing. Which has different symbols. Which has well, it's you. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's why I'm not sure. All right. Anyway, of course, as you know, Shaw one has his own collisions. This is because it did not take two to the any computations because there were defects in Shaw one found. There were a series of defects found by some Chinese mathematicians over the last decade or more, I think, where they kept finding a way to chop down the two to the 80 down or two to the 72 and then sort it until Google finally made it. So Google made these two files, which look uh, Sha one, a good doc and a bad doc. And if you, you can download them and play with them, which I did, Shattered one and Shattered two, and if you calculate the SHA-1 sum of them, it's the same, 3876, 3876, but if you calculate the MD5, it's different because the files are actually different. And they look different. Their PDFs are different colors. And so it took Google, I think, 6,000 years of processor time to do that. So obviously they had a big cluster of 6,000 machines and ran it for a year or 24,000 ran it for a few months or something of that order to do it. And um, that's the game here. They announced they gave it a nice logo. She so put it on t-shirts and all that because that is how you push vulnerabilities these days. Yeah. Shaman is from MD5, right? Shaman is from the same family as MD5. First there was MD4, which Microsoft still uses for password hashes. Then came MD5, which was the first really widely used hash function built into almost everything. Then people found collisions in MD5, so they invented Shaman, which is the first one approved by the government. The previous ones were just around, but the government didn't approve them for any purpose. Shaw one was supposed to be the trustworthy one forever, but about 10 or 15 years ago, mathematicians started finding defects in it, in it, in it, in it. so they wouldn't really have to make any calculations, and so they had a contest to make Shaw two, and they had another contest to make Shaw three, and it ended a couple years ago. So now we have two generations of replacements for Shaw one. And Shaw two is the one we're going up to, and since everyone saw this coming, and they predicted, that um, there would be a break in the year 2016 or 2017. They thought there would be a collision in SHA-1. So everybody deprecated SHA-1-based certificates. Um, and right now, no common browser will accept a digital certificate that's based on SHA-1. Everybody has to upgrade to SHA-2 or the page will pop up SSL errors when you visit the browser. Yeah. So um, you said that the mathematicians found a flaw and said that a what was the flaw and can, can we comprehend it? I've never heard any explanation of the flaw in simple language. Okay. I just saw the results. You should have taken two to the 80 calculations. They were able to trim that down a little to like um, two to the 72 or 73, and then some of you able to trim it down to like two to the 70 or something. And that's why people said pretty soon we'll reach the point as the computers get faster and they keep finding a way to narrow this down, those two are going to collide pretty soon. Okay. That's all. But yeah, so somehow it didn't succeed in forcing you to try two to the 80 calculations to get in. There was a way to carefully choose uh, ones to get in. And so anyway, that's a game here. Now there's a, it's worth mentioning something about clear, uh, hash functions back here. The way hash functions work is you have, you do a block, you do another block, you do another block, and you're crash chasing through the file. So um, we'll talk next time about HMACs that are based on this, but it is the case and this is how most of the collisions are found, that you could take a file, hash it up to a certain point, and when you add one more block, you just have to do one round of calculation to add it. So a lot of the attacks are based on adding stuff to an existing file and finding out a way to maliciously add stuff that undoes the last stuff you added and does something predictable. That's how it often works. That's the fundamental weakness of hash functions, is you, you might want to hash a file that's more than your available RAM. So when you hash a file, you don't need to put process the whole file at once. You just need one block and hash it, then put it down, do the next block and hash it, the next block and hash it. And that fact that the hash function is just sort of ever-increasing accumulation of data leads to a variety of attacks. And we'll talk about it next time. There's HMACs 
where you have a secret before the data and then you hash it. And there's, there, there's an actual you put the secret before the data and secret after the data. And when you put the secret before the data, it's very easy to fool it because you just get a valid encrypted string, a valid hashed signed string, and then you add something to the end. And you can take the existing signature and add more data to it without knowing the secret. Because the way hash functions work, if you hash the first half of a file and restore that number, you can anybody can continue hashing from that point forward without really knowing the first half. Because hash functions are just accumulating like a total as you go along. That when I first heard about this, it's very much like the problem in cipher block chaining, which I must say was obvious to me when I first saw it. Hey, wait a minute, you take the output of the first block to encrypt the next block, that suggests there's going to be a, a way to hack this. I'm messing with the first block to affect the next block, and indeed there is. That's the uh, padding oracle attack. And there are similar attacks coming up for hash functions. Anyone? Anyway. Yeah. So the SHA one, you have the uh, maximum size of file size? Yeah. So that is based on your, your AD durations? No. Um, it's just designed, you could just, the, the ties here has nothing to do with 2 to the 80. It seems to me entirely arbitrary. They could have chosen 128 bits here. And that, that would have been just fine, and then be able to handle up to 2 to the 128. It just seems to me like an entirely arbitrary decision, how big the file was. Just when this was designed, I guess 2 to the 64 seemed big enough that they figured they didn't need any more. But I don't think it's related at all to the 80 rounds. No. I don't see any reason why they couldn't have just made this longer. That would be a trivial alteration in SHA-1 with no apparent consequence that I can see. But when, but when say one put the 80, 80 rounds, it then it stops, right? It spit out a number, right? Oh, you do 80 rounds for each block. Oh. For each block, this, this whole mess here is one block of 512 bits. Then you have to do it to the next block and the next block and the next block. That's why it takes a while. But these operations are chosen specifically to be really fast. So it doesn't, otherwise it would take hours to hash a big file. And you don't want that because obviously you want to verify code before it runs and verify movies before it plays and all that. So even if you have, you know, a one terabyte file, you want it to calculate pretty fast. And it does calculate pretty fast. All right, these are good questions. I think I've got some cahoots anyway. Let's see, anything else here? Nothing I think but cahoots. Yeah, all right. So here they are. What's the name of some of these? What's that? So where do we name SHA-1 and Oh, no, it's, that's, the, the names are, are just like USDA grade AB. Uh, uh, AES is advanced, first DES is data encryption system, stamped by the US government. AES is advanced encryption system, encryption system and SHA is secure hash algorithm. Uh, the actual algorithm is written by another guy given a different name, and it won the award of being SHA-1. That's just a label the US government stamps on it. So, yeah. What's the difference between SHA-2 and SHA-3? Uh, SHA-3 I know is based on KeyCheck, and what I've heard is there, uh, SHA-2 is very similar to SHA-1, but just longer. And people were afraid it might fall to the same mathematical algorithm, so they tried to have a different algorithm for SHA-3. But I have not seen any analysis in this depth of the internals of it. I know SHA-2 is quite a bit like SHA-1, just longer. And that's why they made SHA-3. But so far, nothing bad has happened to SHA-2. Uh, and that's what we're all currently using. As far as I know, nobody's using SHA-3 for anything yet because they're all expecting SHA-2 to last for the indefinite future. All right, good. I don't have very many answers, but these are good questions. All right, so we've got a few cahoots. All right. Yes. And 
before that was published, there were prices for people who published the first collision, like for Bitcoin on the blockchain. And so what happened was someone other than Google knew about that, and so they submitted Google's collision into that and got a prize. Oh, yeah. I, that's interesting. I was not aware of this. So if someone won a prize by stealing Google's work. Well, not blockchain. stealing, but there was a prize for submitting the first Shawn collision on the launch or something. Uh, oh, and the, and the okay. prize was some good number of bitcoins, so oh. say maybe more than ten thousand dollars. Oh, hey, why don't you send me? So, a, yeah, if you send me a link, I'll add that to the news and stuff. That's interesting. I did not know that, and I don't know why they bothered because Bitcoin is based on Shop Five Twelve anyway, or Shop Two Fifty Six. But I guess they were just interested because mm -hmm. nobody they, they, they didn't make a mistake of basing Bitcoin on one of these breakable hashes. Anyway, so four of these questions. All right, which one algorithm has no collisions? All right, SHA-2 is the only one. All the rest have no collisions. All right, which security property is one wayness? All right, that's pre-image resistance, good. All right, what property did Google break? All right, strong collision resistance, not weak collision resistance, is what they broke. All right. If the MD5 hash is 128 bits long, how many files do you have to hash before you find a collision? To the 64. That's right. So, all right. So, Archium and NH. I know who that is. And Joker. I don't know who Joker is. They'll have to tell me who they are. Um, NH, I remember though. Is Joker in the room? Joker must be online. Well, I should be able to, here we are, I should be able to see the chat. Perhaps Joker can tell me who they are. And then again, maybe not. Well, either way, I, um, nobody has done the last couple challenges, so I recommend checking it out. I'm surprised nobody has. Neither of these is impossible. The, the last challenge in 12 and 16, I'm still the only one. Doesn't seem right. I'm still trying. Oh, I'm running right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, you should. It only takes a couple minutes. Oh, okay. None of them take hours. This one here is the toughest, and it took me, I think, two minutes to accomplish. Okay. So none of them are that hard. Um, this is not this one. This one here only took like a second. This one here took maybe two or three minutes of computation. But anyway, you it's just where you have to. Uh, forge a signature and make it spell something out, but only three letters long. And this, that's the existential forgery attack. And here, you need to fill in these three missing characters, which really doesn't take that much shot. Uh, that many guesses. It's 64 cubed, which doesn't take Python long at all. One great thing about Python is it's, it's really fast, even though it's interpreted. But I think they wrote the functions really efficiently. So when you call a function, the function is really fast. It's 16 cubed and a 64 cubed. 64 cubed. Yeah. Each one of these is 64 bits. Yeah, 16. 16, 64 options. It's just a hex, right? Hex. Yeah, this is not hex. No, this is base 64. That's why it's got uppercase, lowercase, and numbers in it. Each one of these has 64 options. That's 64 cubed. But even that is not out of reach of Python. It only takes a couple seconds to try that many. All right, anyway. I'm going to stop the meeting and go to the lab and see if anybody wants help there.